I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Before I continue with this next part, I want to go ahead and say that I deeply regret doing the things I did when I was younger, and I don't condone breaking the law or doing the kind of things that I did back then. But anyways, I used to break into people's houses or garages and I would steal. Whatever I could find for food money or really whatever I wanted to spend it on. I should also mention that I live in a very bad part of Nashville by the way, but I would stay with my grandparents who had custody of my older brother on the weekends. Well, this particular weekend when I was about 13, I was going through some people's backyards looking for unlocked cars or garages. Well, I happened to notice the back door was open, about 4 or 5 inches with no lights on anywhere downstairs. So being the 13 year old kid that I was, I go into the house. And while tiptoeing through the house trying to steal stuff like TVs and game systems, as well as computers, I heard a high pitched scream. But it was muffled if you can understand what I'm saying. Well, that stopped me dead in my tracks and caused me to listen way more intently. After the muffled scream, I had heard a slap and what sounded like someone then telling them, don't bother screaming because nobody can hear you screaming down here. So I slowly start walking towards the screams and I found a door cracked open that led to the basement and I could tell there was a light on in the basement. I end up laying on the floor and looking down the steps towards the center of the basement and I see that a man and a woman are tied up to some chairs in the basement and both are gagged. The difference was that the man had his head hanging limp and he had blood all over his chest and he didn't even look like he was breathing. When I saw this I got really scared and then I took off running, making all kinds of noise. I know that it was loud enough for the intruder downstairs to hear me and freak out and start running up after me, but I just ran as fast as possible out the front door. I didn't even bother unlocking the screen door. I just ran right through it and ran down to the corner house, where I knew the owner was a firefighter. I start beating on his door, screaming for help, that there's a man chasing me trying to kill me like he did the neighbor. Well, this really freaked out the homeowner and it caused him to pull out a weapon on me first until he noticed the deranged man running behind me at full speed, who had a matchet in one hand and a kitchen knife in the other. Without saying a word, the fireman opened fire and he shot the guy in his leg, which caused him to fall, and it also caused the kitchen knife to go right through his own neck. I believe that actually killed him on sight. I never heard him make any noises, but I was making enough for myself at the moment. The fireman called the police before heading towards the neighbor's house that the man came from, and he then found the wife barely clinging to her own life. But unfortunately, the husband was pronounced dead on the scene. What I heard around the neighborhood afterwards was that the husband had been in a car accident about six. Months before this, and the said crazy man's wife had apparently died in that car wreck. This caused the man to go crazy and start drinking and doing drugs until he just didn't care about living and he just wanted everyone to suffer like he and his wife had. So he went to the man's house and he tortured him and his wife for hours until he passed out from the pain. The intruder slit the husband's throat and before chasing me, he slit the wife's throat as well. But luckily, the paramedics were able to save her when they arrived. So yeah kids, don't break into other people's homes. You just might stumble onto something that you can't get out of. The apartment complex was beautiful. It was a smaller complex located right in the heart of a quiet and nestled community. Most of the residents in the complex were older folks that were retired and just didn't need the space of an entire house. When I was moving into the building, I noticed another young person like me watching from one of the windows. It was a beautiful girl, someone that personally I would consider to be out of my league. Unfortunately, my career didn't allow for much dating. After moving in, I noticed that often. I would come or go from the parking lot and I would see the woman looking at me. I just assumed that she was nosy or something like that and I didn't think for one second that she had any interest in me. Down the road from the complex was a grocery store that was very convenient to stop in on my way home from work. One afternoon after work when I stopped in the store to grab some dinner, I ended up physically running into the girl who had been staring at me for a few days now and I literally mean that we physically collided with each other. I was turning into an aisle with my head on my phone and she was walking out of the aisle. In a nervous voice she said, oh my gosh I'm so sorry I'm just an idiot sometimes. I started to say it was okay but stopped when I realized who it was. Once everything clicked I said, hey are you the girl that lives in my building? She started to smile and blush and then said, yeah that's me. I'm usually the one who gets nervous and blushes uncontrollably in these kinds of situations so it was nice that the heat was on someone else for a change. She made some comments about her stupid cheeks turning red 
and I responded by telling her that in high school my friends used to call me a cherry pie because my face was always red. We both laughed as I diffused the tension. We made small talk for a little while right there in the store and then that evolved into a real conversation. Finally, I worked up the courage to ask if she wanted to come over for dinner tonight since we were practically neighbors. She smiled and looked thrilled by that offer. She accepted and said that she would be over at around 7 and we exchanged numbers and about our shopping. I was so excited and nervous about my date with this very attractive neighbor that I had. I realized that I only had about an hour to clean my apartment and get ready. I hadn't had a real date since my freshman year of college over four years ago so I was admittedly a train wreck in my mind. I even remember while I was cleaning the apartment I got a text from her that said I can't wait for tonight with a heart. Before I knew it, it was said that she was knocking on my door. The first several hours were amazing. We talked, ate dinner, had some wine, and just had a great evening. I felt like this was my first real adult date, and I was proud of how it was unfolding. Late in the evening, I was ready for bed, and this was a weeknight, and I had to work the next day, and I could tell that she wanted to stay, but I made it clear that I wasn't ready for anything further than this. She was understanding, and we said goodnight at around 11 p.m. when I walked to her door, which sat about 30 feet from my door. I kissed her goodnight, and she smiled. I walked inside my apartment with an overwhelming feeling of joy and happiness. I woke up at around 3 a.m. that morning just to use the bathroom, then I noticed. Something weird as I walked into the hall and the light that was shining under the door to my apartment was a shadow like someone was standing in front of my door. I figured it was my tired eyes just playing tricks on me so I didn't worry too much. After the bathroom when I walked by the door again I noticed that the obstruction to the light was still there. I quietly went over to the door and looked through the peephole in the door and standing right outside my door was the girl that I had just shared an entire evening with. She looked like she was mumbling something under her breath, but I wasn't sure. If I ever looked through one of those holes, they're not very clear sometimes, so I watched for a few seconds and she didn't move at all. I snuck back into my room and grabbed my phone. I made sure that it was silent and went back to the door and I texted her phone and said, hey, I can't sleep, but I just wanted to let you know that I had a great time tonight. Seconds later, she grabbed her phone from her pocket and with no expression on her face, she responded with me too with an exclamation point, I can't wait to see you again. I waited for a moment and then sent another text that said, I'm surprised you're awake. What are you up to? Her response turned the butterflies in my stomach to stone when she responded with, oh, just laying in bed watching Netflix. I couldn't understand why she was standing there and lying about it. I didn't respond to her text right away. I had no idea what to say to this woman or how to approach a situation like this. While I was thinking of something to say, she texted me again this time saying, if you want, I can come back or you can come here. The text was followed by a bunch of emojis. I started to type a response but kept deleting whatever I typed. While I was typing, she texted me again and said you have nothing to be afraid of and that text hit me differently for some reason. I finally sent a simple text that just read thanks for the offer, but I'm really tired. I looked through the hole as she read the message and still with no expression on her face, she put the phone back in her pocket and looked right at the people. I knew she couldn't see me, but the horror that I felt when I sort of made eye contact with a woman through the door was almost indescribable. The look on her face was not the same look I had just admired that evening prior. Her eyes looked cold, and I have no idea what her intentions were, but I just felt like they weren't good. I know I'm not good at dating, but I do know standing outside someone's door in the middle of the night motionless is not normal behavior. I decided to text her one last time and said, hey, did you hear anything funny in the hall? I thought I heard a knock on my door. This was my poor attempt to try and fish something out of her or at least elicit some reaction. She looked at the text for a minute then back at the people with her cold eyes as if though she knew I was there and without moving from her position she texted me one last time that said you're a smart boy very smart sleep type. She put her head back down and after about 5 minutes of just standing there she turned around and went back to her apartment. She looked like she had something tucked in the back of her pants but looking through the people this could have just been my imagination so I wasn't sure. I texted her the next day and she never responded. Even though she lived a few doors down, I never did run into her again. I left a note for her one time and slipped it under her door and still never heard from her. I never told the apartment management because I didn't really think anything could be done. It was an unnerving and terrifying experience for me, but I had no proof other than a few text messages that didn't show anything legal or really make any sense. I never saw her again, which is insane considering that I lived at this apartment for six months after this experience. The curtains were always shut when I would get home from work and I'd never cross paths with her in the hallway. 
Now I know the story isn't your typical oh god I'm gonna die story, but to put yourself in my shoes I guarantee you wouldn't want to be me. The memory of that look in her eyes still haunts me to this day. Friends have always joked with me that she probably was just looking for some adult companionship, but I promise you this was different. Be careful out there because you never know what kind of intentions people have deep down. So this happened last year when I was house sitting for my neighbor. He was in the hospital for a few days recovering from surgery and I had been asked to stay in the house to keep an eye on this cat's. The house was pretty small but it was on a nice wide open property by the woods and there was a tiny swinging cat flap on the kitchen door where the cats could come and go as they please. The flap led into a screened in back porch and the house only had one bedroom so I chose to sleep on the couch in the living room. After cleaning up, feeding the cats and watching some till I shut off all the lights and laid back on the couch. I had my phone out and was casually scrolling through Facebook when I heard the flap, swinging back and forth. From where I was in the living room I couldn't see the door. Because the counter was in the way, but I glanced over to see where the cat scamper over and leap up on my legs. I gave it a welcoming pat on the head and continued scrolling. After another minute I heard the cat door make a noise again a soft squeak. This time I didn't even glance over figuring it was the second cat following the first into the house. Another few moments passed and I heard the squeaking again and after another moment it squeaked a third time. I looked up from my phone wondering why the second cat was jumping in and out like that. I was wondering if I would have to scoop it up and put it in the bedroom. The door continued to squeak for another couple of minutes as the second cat continued to jump in and out. I finally decided that I had enough. I put my phone down and sat up on the couch. I began to stretch. As I did I happened to glance behind the couch and my blood froze. The second cat was curled up in its bed in the corner and the first cat was still nestled between my legs. My confusion turned to fear instantly. Was there another animal on the back porch? Another cat maybe? I slowly stood up and carefully made my way over to the back door tiptoeing across the carpet in my socks. The door made a squeaking noise again. I peered around the counter and felt the sensation of my heart leaping up into my throat and at the same moment my stomach dropped. By the faint rays of the night light in the hallway I saw an arm reaching through the cat door, straining to get at the knob. The fingertips were brushing at the lock. For a few short seconds all I could do was stare in terror, frozen by the surreal silent reality of what I was experiencing. It almost didn't feel real. The severity of the situation hit me and I realized that if the intruder got in I wasn't going to stand a chance. I grabbed a large two pronged fork that was used for flipping steaks on a grill and in one swift motion I stabbed at the arm right below the wrist as hard as I could. There came a thunderous scream of pain from the other side of the door and the arm was immediately retracted through the flap. But the fork had impaled the intruder so it caught itself on the door. That produced a second loud scream and the arm was wrenched violently outside. I heard the clatter of the fork on the ground and then I heard footsteps sprint across the back porch and out the screen door. I immediately turned on the outside lights and caught the glimpse of a figure running towards the woods. Instead of calling the cops I scooped up both cats, stuffed them into the same carrier, grabbed my phone and my shoes and sprinted out to my car which was thankfully parked inside the garage. I drove up the road a couple of miles to my place and once I was safely inside I called the cops. It took them half an hour to get to my place and then another half hour of questioning before they continued down the road to check out my neighbor's house. They told me that there was no sign that the screen door had been broken into and aside from the bloodstains there was no sign of the intruder. They put out an alert to local hospitals for a man with a stab wound on his right arm. The following morning the police brought a dog out to follow the scent but whoever the lucky bastard was, he was never caught. I kept the cast at my place until my neighbor was out of the hospital. It still shakes me to my soul. The idea that the stranger chose that house in the middle of nowhere trying to get inside and if I hadn't got off the couch when I did, this may have ended very differently. Me and my family just recently moved to our new house. My dad bought it in an auction. The house was actually better than any of the previous ones we had lived in. It had a big pool in the backside and a small garden beside the pool too. There was a big tree in the garden which grew scented yellow flowers. The backside is probably the only reason why I agreed to move into the house. The house was also close to my school, hence my parents were happy about the safety measures. Both of my parents traveled a lot, so I got accustomed to staying alone in the house from quite a young age. 
We had tight securities and alarms all around this new house too. There was no way anyone could break in without setting off the alarm, so I had nothing to worry about. At the back of the house, there stood an old three-story apartment. I would always see people on the first and second floor, but the third floor felt like no one stayed there. The third story's bedroom windows faced directly at the back side of our house. It was a calm and quiet place, so I kind of liked chilling in my house when my parents were on tour. One weekend, my parents were off to visit my steak aunt in the lab. I stayed back home like usual. It was a Saturday night, and all my friends wanted to hang out at one of my other friends' house. I promised my parents not to stay out late, so after a couple of beers, I came back home. It was 9 p.m., and I wasn't feeling sleepy at all. I went upstairs and got in my bathing suit to go for a swim in the pool. It was a hot summer night. I poured myself a glass of fresh orange juice and put on some music. I swam for some time and then I drank my juice lying on my pool raft. I must have fallen asleep. I heard a noise and I woke up. The back side of the apartment was all empty. No one was around. Just then, my eyes went to the third floor window of the nearby building. A frail old woman was standing in front of the window looking directly at me. Her eyes were so big that her stare kind of freaked me out. I didn't say anything and looked at my watch. It was around 10 p.m. I just continued to lie on my raft, thinking she would leave on her own. After a couple of minutes, when I looked back, she wasn't there on the window. I felt relieved and kept thinking, how come I never saw her before? I almost thought that no one lived on the third floor apartment. That's when I heard my phone ringing. It was inside the house, so I got up out of the pool, thinking it was my parents calling. I was just about to step inside when I heard a voice come from behind me. I froze. It was an old woman's voice. I slowly turned back, and my heart drowned in horror. That old, creepy woman was standing right behind me. There was no way she could have gotten in my backyard without breaking in. Her wide, cold death stare made my legs. No. I literally couldn't walk away, even though I wanted to so badly. I spoke in a broken voice. Ma'am, how did you get inside? She slightly opened her toothless mouth and said, That's the bell. Are you still here? Run away now or your husband will come and bury you there. She then lifted her weak, lean hand and pointed towards the tree in our garden with her long, creepy fingers. My blood turned to ice. I replied in a shaky voice. What are you saying? She didn't answer. She just kept staring at the tree and then back to my face. Her mouth opened and her eyes widened. It was such a horrible sight. Suddenly, my phone again rang, and I ran towards my room frantically this time. I got inside my room and locked it. It was my dad. I answered the phone and stood sobbing terribly. My dad got all freaked out and called 911 on my behalf. The cops came after 10 minutes and I told them an old crazy lady from the nearby apartment entered our backyard and said some very bizarre things to me. They immediately went to the apartment building and asked the landlord about his tenants on the third floor. It came out as a shock when the landlord said that that floor of the apartment had been empty for the last 15 years, but he also said that an old lady used to live on that floor way back in the day. She was sick and bedridden, so she spent most of her time sitting near that window inside the dark room, and that her children left her alone during her last days. She even died sitting near that window. The landlord himself did her cremation rituals. The next morning when my parents came, I told them everything and a lady cop also stood back with me in the house from last night. She also explained to my parents that I might have just had a bad dream or something. But while they were talking, something popped into my mind. I asked my dad what was the name of the previous owner of our house. He replied, saying the bank told him a woman lived here with her husband in the house before we moved in. But he also added that that was 15 years ago, and he asked why I was asking. My heart started to beat faster. I told the cop that the old woman addressed me as Isabel and said her husband buried her under that tree. They both looked pretty surprised, and the cop even decided to check our backyard. When they dug under the tree, scaring the hell out of everyone, a skeleton of a full-grown woman got discovered from our garden. It had a ring on its left hand. Me, along with my mom and my dad, are all completely paranoid. We never knew that there was a dead body lying in our garden. The cops investigated this matter and they came to know that indeed it was a woman named Isabel's remains. Her husband filed the missing persons report, but after filing the report, he too left the house in the town. Due to the lack of evidence, the police couldn't find any details about her. Also, no one came to interrogate him about her. 
Her autopsy report signified that she was murdered by a serious injury made by a blunt object on the back of her head. The cops instantly suspected it was her husband who murdered her and had buried her under that tree. And to this day, they're still searching for her husband. I am almost positive that that old lady saw this entire incident from her room's window, but couldn't tell anyone. Even though people find it hard to believe, I think she came back to tell me about it and I believe it was her ghost that I saw that night. But the question that kept eating my mind was why me? But this too got answered when the cops published Isabel's picture in the local newspaper, stating about the gruesome case. My parents are still in deep shock. I have no idea what to say. Isabel looks exactly like me. Or should I say, I look exactly like her. We're still living in the same house to this day, but I haven't seen that old lady ever again. What had started as nothing more than a New Year's party ended up leading to a tragedy I wince at telling. But for the sake of my own cathartic health, I feel as though I should expand upon what happened as a warning to all of you, my friends. It all happened over New Year's Eve of 2020. After a year ravaged by lockdowns, it was time to unravel with high expectations the year to come and to celebrate the endurance we had shown to get through such harsh conditions the year before. Me and my friends decided to go camping as a celebration. It was out of the city, deep into the forest where nobody would catch us breaking any lockdown rules. That, as per me, was the first mistake of many we made that night. This spot over here looks good, I called out, pointing towards a clearing in the little zone of the forest. I mean, sure, but what about that cave over there? Isn't it a bit weird sleeping near it? My friend John asked with a slightly shaken breath. Nah, don't worry about it. There aren't any dangerous animals that even live in caves in England. Now, let's set up before nighttime approaches so we don't miss our chance to light the fireworks. I was buzzing with excitement. I'd been separated from my friends for months, and this was the first real time we were able to hang out together as a group. Fine, but if anything comes out of there, we would be in a lot of trouble. He motioned towards me and the two others with us, Becca and Tom, both of whom had already made it to around four beers and were practically crawling around the floor like the animals John so clearly feared. The thought made me chuckle, but I hastily got back to prepping the tents and setting up the fireworks before the area became submerged in darkness. Around two hours later, and after many strenuous attempts at setting up the equipment single-handedly thanks to the three drunkards that had become absolutely wasted in the short space of a couple hours, I was finally able to sit down by the fire, slightly distancing myself from the smoke that was masking my face in its thick cloud. The fire crackled and snapped as I sat there. Mesmerized by it, waiting for just a couple minutes longer before taking a lit stick over to the fireworks I'd set up, ready to launch them up into the sky and then left in utter awe at their beautiful explosions of color. All was good until I looked around. I was alone. All my friends had vanished. Now, the fact that I'd taken in at least one to two pints of beer by this point didn't help. It merely caused my brain to clatter about in my skull, causing me to have a blurred vision, still unsure of where my friends had gone. Boy, Oi, Harry, where of? Harry, come see. The disgruntled voice of John immediately made my spirits rise. I could sense his presence. It almost sounded like he was over by the firework. My head snapped towards the direction of the screaming firework, only to see a bright spark fly off into the trees, followed by a deafening boom, resulting in that same bright flash of colors I had just been excited to watch fizzle out, the sparks catching onto the trees. And in accordance with the explosion itself, there was a sudden shriek emanating from a human voice. Help! I heard Becca's voice screech off in the distance. My blood vessels began to surge with a flood of adrenaline coursing through my veins with such pressure and energy that I bolted towards her voice, still pleading out for help. I came across her in a matter of moments. Fortunately, the stage of intoxication I was in made it appear to be a stimulant. But as for her and the others, they were forced to crawl for the most basic of movements. Jesus Christ, Becca, what the fuck happened? I was enveloped in a seething fury, with the only emotion weighing against it being panic. It was John. He fired off the firework, and Tom was in the way. My mind collapsed in on itself at her foul words. I denied it to myself that they could be so utterly stupid. But then, as I twisted my head round ever so carefully, I witnessed a burnt Tom lying against a tree. His arm was scorched, covered in a black silk from the gunpowder. His legs were trembling with shock, and he appeared to be in a lot of pain. I grabbed Becca by the arms, gave her a shake, and then furiously asked, Where is John? Her eyes swelled up with tears. 
She must have been terrified, but she did manage to blubber out the words right behind you. I dropped her and swiveled my head right round, only to be met with a horrifically drunken grin smiling back at me. Here it comes, here it comes round two. John then sparked a match, held it beneath the firework he held in his hand, facing towards us. And quite literally, in a flash, the rocket whizzed out of his hands whilst he was still cackling, and launched towards us with such a pace that, in complete honesty, we shouldn't have been able to avoid. But by some miracle, the firework, obviously being aimed poorly, flew past both our heads and from behind. We heard a seismic wave of noise crash against us, erupting from the small crater left in a tree just meters away, the colors still lighting up the area with a fluorescent glow. From that point onwards, I sprinted towards John, cackling him to the ground and punishing him with a storm of blows, intending to knock him unconscious so he would stop firing off rockets at us. He was very evidently drunk, first considering he was launching fireworks at his friends, but also in the way he grinned as he set them off, and even now, as my fist collided with his face. There seemed something sinister in him, but it was far too difficult to identify what. Eventually, though, my rage got him, and he lay still on the grass, still holding that wretched grin. Becca and I then hauled Tom's body, which was verging on becoming the corpse, back to the car. We then went back for John, whom I dragged against the foliage, only to then chuck him in the back of the boot, far away from anyone he could hurt. After that night, we sent them both to the hospital and then waited for the results. John was of course going to be fine, as unfortunate as that may be, but we were scared for Tom. Miraculously, after just a couple days in hospital, news came that Tom was recovering well and would be fit soon. All three of us are still good friends. As for John, we haven't spoken since. We wrote it off as an accident, but to me, that vicious grin posed a deeper meaning that nobody else was able to see. Was it really alcohol that caused John's bloody rampage, or perhaps something deep within him? The worst of nightmares can be forged from the most simple of dreams. One moment you're just a normal girl going on a vacation with her friend, and the next moment you're caught in a murder. My feet brushed against the leaves of the bushes as I made my way through the mountainous terrain. I could hear laughter coming from behind me as we were on our way through the trail. Okay, I'm pretty sure that we're lost, I called out as I turned around to face Abby. It was getting dark and the sun was already starting to set. No, I told you we're going on our own turf. I can't stand seeing the Alps with Joey the tour guide anymore, she said with a huff as she came to stand beside me. Abby and I were on a vacation to celebrate our finally finishing college. It was her idea for us to go to the Alps because it was on her bucket list. We had never been there before, but she seemed obsessed with the water springs that were located on the side of the mountain. Our guard had warned us initially against going there because the locals weren't very welcoming towards tourists, but Abby didn't care. She was always very strong-headed like that, and she preferred to do her own thing. Well, as long as you don't get us killed, I muttered under my breath. She didn't bother to respond as we continued making our way down the trail. We had long lost sight of the rest of the group, and although I wondered where they had gone off to, I was more focused on making sure that Abby didn't get us into trouble. It was getting dark and we hadn't found the springs, and neither had we brought any torch light with us. I shook my head as I realized that I couldn't do this anymore. I grabbed a hold of Abby's hand as I stopped her in her tracks. We should head back. I can't do this anymore, I scoffed, rolling her eyes at me as she made her way deeper into the forest. I groaned, knowing that I had to follow behind her now. Stop it, I hissed, but she didn't listen. Stop worrying about everything. It's gonna be fine, she stated as she backed up against a tree. She didn't get to finish her sentence as a net shot out of the ground and encased her in it. She let out a scream and I widened my eyes as I made my way over. She began to struggle as she hung several feet off the ground. I'm gonna get you out, I said as I reached out to tub on the rope. As I pulled on the rope that was attached to the tree, I felt something encased around me and before I could react, I was also suspended in the air. I let out a loud scream as I found myself encased in the net just like Abby. We were stuck. I tried calling out for help multiple times, but it didn't work as no one seemed to be listening. After several hours, I heard the sound of leaves crunching as a figure in a loincloth and white face paint appeared in front of us. I opened my mouth to scream once more and watched as he pulled out a blow dart shooter and fired one right at my forehead. I felt my heart race as black dots covered my vision, and as he fired the second shot, I passed out. I woke up to the sounds of loud screams coming from all around me. 
The warmth of the fire was hot against my skin as I had a pounding headache. I groaned loudly as I pulled my eyes open and gasped in shock at the sight around me. I was in a bamboo cage, and I heard a loud chanting coming in front of me. Several men and women danced around the bonfire. I looked around me frantically and took notice of Abby's unconscious body in the corner. I crawled over to her and shook her body slightly. I gasped when I noticed that her neck had been slid open. My eyes watered as I choked like a stout at the realization that she was dead. We must bring one man and woman for the ritual. The man first. I heard a voice call out as I scurried the corner of the cage. I heard loud screaming once more and then watched the men break off from the bonfire. One of the men had a large bone going through his nose. He turned to look at me with a smirk. I heard shuffling beside my cell and watched as a man wearing cargo shorts was dragged out of his cell. I took notice of a stone slab beside the bonfire and watched frozen in my spot as the man was lifted onto it and tied down onto the slab. He struggled as I watched him pull out a cloth and stuff it into his mouth in order to silence his cries. The man that had stared at me earlier, who I assumed was the chief, made his way over and pulled out a blade. He climbed on top of the captive, and I watched as he slid his wrists open. The blood splattered on the ground as I heard the people chant loudly. There were men banging their drums in the corner as the women cheered in celebration. The chief lifted the blade once more into the air as he stabbed the man in his chest. The man continued to struggle as the chief raised the blade into the air one last time before saying a sacrifice for the gods. He then slit the man's throat open as he ended his life. I watched with a numb feeling as the body was removed from the altar and thrown into the bonfire. They muttered words in a strange tongue before turning their attention towards me. I pressed my body against the back of the cell, but it was of no use as it was pulled open and two men came inside and dragged me out. All eyes were on me in the dimly lit clearing as I was led toward the slab. I struggled in their hold, screaming frantically as tears streamed down my cheeks. They were much stronger than me as they tied me down onto the slab. They began to hum lowly as someone placed a dirty cloth in my mouth. It tasted like blood. I heard footsteps approaching me as the chief came over to the slab and climbed on top of my abdomen. I stared into his soulless eyes as he lifted up the same bloody dagger and slit my wrist with it. I cried out in pain, but it was muffled by the cloth and watched as he pulled it out before stabbing my chest, causing my body to lurch. He raised the blade one last time as he said, a sacrifice for the gods. Just as he pressed the blade to my neck, I felt something come over my body as I grabbed a hold of it. I looked up at him with hate-filled eyes before plunging the knife into his neck. I watched as he gurgled and blood splattered on my face. He convulsed for a moment before collapsing on top of me. Sacrifice for the gods, I said coarsely. During the 1970, Alexandra did her own share of partying along with her other fellow co-eds during her college days. She traced the outlines of the party scene and that of course led to her to make party acquaintances and associations. A part of the 70s scene and leftover free-spiritedness from the 60s led to a lot of pitch hiking and relying on the kindness of strangers, as well as your own ability to judge a character whenever you accepted a ride from them. Alexandra and her party acquaintance friend found themselves waiting for a bus at a city bus stop one day. They had been waiting for about 10 minutes when a young man pulled over and offered the two young co-eds a ride instead of waiting. Even Alexandra, with her caution towards strangers, was tempted to accept his offer. Her feet hurt from a particularly long day and week, and she was tired. Her friend, however, readily accepted the ride, turning back to Alexandra to see if she was coming also. However, whilst not breaking eye contact with a seemingly kind stranger, Alexandra politely declined his offer. So, Alexandra waved goodbye to her friend and waited for her bus as the man pulled back into traffic, driving her friend away with him. Life went on as usual for Alexandra after she caught her bus and got on with the rest of her day since she didn't really speak to that friend often. College exams and life in general occupied Alexandra's mind. Before she knew it, college was over for her and the years passed quickly. It wasn't until just recently that Alexandra saw her old college buddy appear on her TV screen. But to Alexandra's horror, she quickly realized that she was seeing her friend's college picture displayed along with Ed Kemper's other murder victims. Alexandra was totally shocked upon realizing her friend's state. She felt guilty that she didn't try to stop her friend from going with him, but her friend had caught free rides dozens of times and felt that she was a good enough judge of character. Not only that shocked Alexandra though, but also the fact that she herself had looked into serial killer Ed Kemper's eyes that fateful day. 
between May of 1972 and April 1973, Ed Kemper committed several brutal murders. Most of his victims were college co-eds, but what makes Ed's case different is the fact that at just 15 years old, the first two victims he claimed were his own grandparents. After that, he went on to take the lives of six innocent co-eds. He ended his brutal killing spree when he murdered his own mother and her best friend. Ed's killing methods vary from shootings, stabbings, and even strangulation. He liked to cruise around in his car and choose his co-ed victims and then offer them a ride. The innocent young co-eds that accepted his act of kindness had no idea that that would be the last ride they would ever accept from a stranger. I'm sure that a lot of you hearing this out there understand that you always question what you could have done differently in order for that person to still be alive today. But to me at least, the truth behind deaths by murder may simply come down to a matter of wrong place, wrong time. For example, I have heard of a case of three women murdered out in Yosemite by Carrie Stainer several times and from different angles. In one account, I believe that it was said that Carrie actually originally intended to kill another woman he had been seeing and also her children. Apparently, she wasn't home when he went to try and execute his deadly plan. So allegedly, as a result, he happened to have spotted the three female visitors of Yosemite on their way out of their hotel, where Carrie Stainer worked as a maintenance man. If one of those three women would have just taken a few seconds longer to leave the hotel room, maybe they all would have waited back and Carrie never would have spotted them. It's just a theory, but to me, that part of reality is truly terrifying. Please everyone stay safe, keep your safe practices, and most importantly, follow your gut instincts. It was late 2016 and I just started my new job at a motel. It was low pay, but I needed an office job as it was required for my training. One of my friends, Michael, got me this job. For a few days, I did training with the owner in the mornings, and for two nights, Michael trained me. Our job was the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Nothing too exciting, just checking guests in and doing paperwork. My boss, who is the owner, went away with his wife on vacation for a week, which is attributed to the swift training I had to endure. So it was my first night alone on the night shift. There was a monitor with security cameras around the motel's property and large glass windows all around the office building with glass doors and there was no night window like most motels have. It was fairly early in the night at about 1 a.m. I was just doing my normal paperwork when a man walks in and asked if we have any rooms available. Usually if someone is sketchy, my boss has me lie and say no, but he seemed normal at the moment. However, we just had a meeting on customer satisfaction and our boss was really encouraging us to be more polite to guests. Without hesitation, I said, uh, yes, of course, just for one, and he replies, yes. So I begin creating the reservation on the computer when I notice he starts swatting in the air and making spitting noises as if he were being surrounded by flies. I tried to ignore it, and as far as I was concerned, it wasn't my business, so I try to check him into the room as quickly as possible. I give him his key, and he's on his way. At this point in time, I could be described as very timid and had a lot going on in my personal life, so I hope you could all understand my reaction to what happens next. The man comes back from his room and slams his hand on the glass door and causes me to jump. Absolutely frightened, I look up to see him just staring at me. He cracks the door and puts his head through and says, I can't get into my room, why won't you let me into my room? My only defense is trying to be helpful, so I replied with, oh, um, maybe there's something wrong with your key here, let me give you another one. The look he had in his eyes was inexplicable. I felt like I was in absolute danger. I handed him his new key and he went back to his room. I tried texting Michael because he was the train me. Though it was in the middle of the night and he was asleep, I needed some guidance. With no reply from Michael, I noticed the man trudging down the stairs to come back, and I go into absolute panic mode. I run into the back office and lock the door and I pull out my pocket knife. It's important to keep protection for working at night. All the while I hear the man in the office yelling, hello, hello, why won't you let me into my room? Do you not like me? Me being an absolute idiot and not sitting my ground and calling the police when I'm feeling scared, I decided to take the situation on alone. I replied that I'm just on the phone, I'll be right out. I then start calling Michael over and over for help, but no answer. I decided to take a few deep breaths and then step out of the office. However, the man was not there, but rather in the bathroom. I start hearing him talking to himself, saying, kill her, kill her, kill her. My heart sank. Still being an idiot and not calling the police, he comes out and I say, Oh, well, your key was broken. I'm sorry. Let me escort you to your room. He agrees, thankfully. I was wearing a long sleeve sweater, so with my arms down, I was able to hide my knife in my hand while holding it. I began to walk outside, and he seemed insistent to walk behind me. We begin making our way to the staircase and up towards his room. 
I was sweating from how nervous I was cautiously looking behind me to make sure he wasn't going to make a move. He stops at a room and I stop at his room a few doors down, I smile, and I say, oh, that's the wrong room, this is your room. As it clearly said on the door. The whole time he was going to someone else's room trying to open the door. I quickly ran back to the office and locked the door. The next guest I checked in was a police officer from a few towns away. I felt bad for him about the guy, but they seemed willing to keep an eye out in Europe. The next night, the man came back, but had the doors locked and told him we were all booked up. I explained to my boss what happened when he got back from vacation, however, he didn't take me that seriously. I continued to work there on the night shift for the next year, where many other strange encounters happened. So strange man, let's never meet again. If you ever feel uncomfortable, always call the police. More than a few years ago, I'd say a good 10 years ago, my mother-in-law will call her B for anonymity's sake. But B was living with me and my husband, her son, for a short period due to her ongoing medical issues at the time. We just thought it would be better for her to be with us for a while. Now let me inform you that B was not your typical mother-in-law. She was a serious addict and had been in and out of prison my husband's entire life. But in her older age and health issues, she had been in recovery for eight years strong. When she was using her DOC, she would get so geeked up that she would stay awake for 45 days at a time, nonstop. When she would get like that, she would want to go and rose old houses, or abandoned houses, go through them and taking what she thought was anything of value. Well, one day, I had just walked in my front door to find a note on my kitchen table with what looked like a printout of a Google Earth image search. The note was from B. It stated that she was just playing around on Google Earth, looking around in the area we were currently living, and said she had found an abandoned house deep in the woods, fairly close to our house. The house had no mailbox, no driveway, not even the remnants of a driveway. At least, not that the printout showed. So I got a Google Earth app myself, located the abandoned house in Nope. No driveway, no mailbox, not even a listed address. And the strangest part was the distance from the main road to the house would have been a good mile hike. There was no dirt road leading to the house. Not even a foot trail. I'm not sure what possessed me, but I looked over at B and asked her, you want to go find this house? Needless to say, there was no hesitation on her part and my genuine curiosity had gotten the best of me. So fast forward a few days and the following weekend, we set out to locate this abandoned house. The road that we had to beat on in order to come semi-close to accessing the house was at the end of a residential suburban neighborhood. So we parked the car and started our hike through briars and poison oak and everything in between. It was a rough little hike, but about a good almost mile and we both look up and lo and behold right there in the middle of this dense forest was a clearing. A little less than half a football field with a small simple little house with a small stone wall off to the side. I was shocked to say the least. I looked over at B and she had the expression of pure excitement all over her face. It didn't take her long to find a way into the house and to start moves and us, I decided to remain outside. I don't know something just told me I didn't need to go in that house. So as I'm standing outside this abandoned house in the middle of nowhere, I walk over towards the old stone well, just off the left of the house. I reached the opening to the well and peered down, not being able to see much. I stepped back and sat down on one of the big rocks right next to the well. I then out of boredom, my guest picked up a big stone and tossed it into the well, hearing the kerplunk as the stone tumbled down and hit the water at the bottom. So I stand up and I lean toward the well with the most horrific rotting putrid smell hits me like a ton of bricks. The smell was so bad it felt like it burned the inside of my nose, and let me tell you, it's that smell that once you smell it, you will never forget it. I dubbed my little flashlight out of my pocket and pointed it down the dark well. When I was able to focus on what I was actually looking at, I fell backwards, as if I was pushed by an unseen force falling flat on my butt. I'll never forget what I saw at the bottom of that well. Two elbows and the back of a head with long hair. That smell was the smell of a decaying human body. I don't think I've ever ran that fast in my life. I just took off not even telling B I was leaving. I just started running and didn't stop until I reached the car. I sat in my car for about an hour just trying to process what I had just found and waited on B to figure out that I had already left. She finally made it back to the car with all the valuables she had found in hand. When she finally got in the passenger seat, I was as white as a ghost and was in shock. She asked me what was wrong and I told her exactly what I found. Her jaw hit the floor and she too turned as white as I was. I wasn't sure what to do to be honest so I simply drove to the closest store and called the non-emergency 911 line and explained what I had just found and how I stumbled onto it. 
Needless to say, the investigator thought me and B were basically full of crap, but he got in his car and followed us to the end of the neighborhood and explained that he would have to hike a good mile to find the abandoned house and the well where the body was. No more than 20 minutes later, we see police cars and the coroner van pull up at the end of the neighborhood. Eventually, they started to tape off the entire wooded area. As I'm just sitting in my car asking one of the many officers there if B and I could leave, I look past the officer to see two people carrying out a black completely zipped up body bag and placing it into the back of the coroner's van. I shuddered at the thought of who that person was or what could have happened to them. A few months later, I get a phone call from one of the detectives working on the body in the well case. She wanted to inform me that they were able to identify who the person in the well was. She was a 24-year-old female who had been reported missing out of a small town called Between Georgia seven to eight months ago. Between Georgia was only an hour and a half drive without traffic from where her body was found. The craziest part is the multiple detectives on this case live and grew up in the area where the body was found their entire lives, most of them being in their mid to late 50s, and not one of them have ever known about or heard of the abandoned house in the middle of the woods. This happened when I was about 28. I'm almost 40 now. This occurrence comes into my brain from time to time. I try to pass it off like it wasn't a big deal or nothing substantial happened, but it's rarely been successful. There's a reason I still think about it over 10 years later. It started when my future wife and I were getting ready to have a nice night out. It was Christmas time. For some reason, I remember that because our town always changed, the streetlights on our little subdivision still red and green. To be clear, it was only the rustic looking ones that dotted the entrance and exit to the sub. They didn't really provide real streetlights. We had actual taller streetlights that of course had to be outfitted with a city approved LED or whatever. It was pretty and a nice touch by the city and our HOA. I was fondly looking at one of the red and green streetlights from our two bedroom apartment. My finance at the time and I had gotten this little place at a great time. Great recession, great prices. Fortunately, we were both working and not doing poorly financially. Since we didn't have children yet, we didn't need much room. This kind of leads into the story. I don't remember the square footage, but it was on the second floor of a three-floor walk-up. It was probably in the range of seven to 800 square feet. Nothing big. We had more than enough room for two of us. That being said, we did not have a great amount of storage to be truthful. We decided to use the smaller second bedroom as a storage room. We enjoyed a very generous master bedroom for both of us and put all of our extra stuff into the second bedroom. As mentioned earlier, we we're getting ready to go out. I got home from work first. It was just getting into the evening. In this part of the world, that means it's already dark outside. As I entered the threshold to my home, I hung my coat up, tossed my keys into a dish that was striped black and white like a referee shirt, and walked toward the kitchen. Being that this place was so small, I passed by both bedrooms as I took a couple steps from the front door to the kitchen. The second bedroom, though, the one we did not use, was open. I might not have noticed it, but the light was on. We never kept the light on in that room. Overcome with a sudden feeling of panic, I froze. Shamefully. But thankfully, that didn't last more than a couple of seconds. I cautiously opened the door. Nothing. And closed the door. Either she was putting storage items in the room and forgot to turn the light off, or the last time I was there, I forgot to turn the light off. Simple as that. Anyway, shut the light off, closed the door. None. We went on to have a great fun night together. After having a few drinks, I brought up the light being left on in the extra bedroom. I think you're busted, I said. She looked at me with a buzzed look of inquiry. When I came home today, the extra bedroom door was open and the light was on. I think I finally confirmed where you keep the presents, I said with a little playfulness in my voice. I haven't been in that room for weeks, she said with a smile on her face. And I keep the presents somewhere you'll never find them, she laughed. I had a brief moment of worry, but quickly put it away from my mind when our next round of shots came from our server. It should have bothered me more now that she confirmed she had not left the door open. As I said, it is possible I went in that room and forgot to close it. But I really doubted that. Several hours later, we stumbled back home, seeing, looking at the holiday lights and the decorations on our walk home. Thankfully, our favorite place to get some late night drinks was only a block away. As she opened the door for us, she threw her keys in the tray, kicked her shoes off and skipped to the living room to throw herself on the couch. I laughed to myself, enjoying the moment and honestly liking where the night was going, until I walked by the extra bedroom. Obviously, she didn't notice. 
The door was open, maybe two to three inches, and the light was on. Being in an inebriated state, the gravity of this situation did not fully hit me. From what I can remember, I stood by the door for longer than I probably should have. I heard my fiance call my name from the living room and it snapped me out of my haze. I quickly reached into the room, slapped the light off, and quietly closed the door. No reason to alert her to some kind of paranormal activity going on. Not tonight. After she went to work the next morning, I sat in the small kitchen trying to decide what was going on. Option 1. Demons. Option 2. There was a very real possibility that someone was in our apartment. Maybe on several occasions. I decided to take a look around the bedroom. The door was still closed from last night, so that's a good sign. The room looked normal. Full of our extra junk, but normal. Until I made my way into the closet. Inside, beside more junk, was a handwritten note. Have fun last night. My fiance and I reported all of this and stayed with a friend until we could get all of our stuff out. I can't tell you how scary seeing that note was.